Hare Krishna. So today morning we are discussing the canto, the instructions of Lord Kapila to Devahuti, and he is speaking here on the glories of devotional service. And while explaining devotional service, he exhibits here a remarkable level of self-criticality. Self-criticality means we need to be able to honestly look at ourselves and admit our own deficiencies, our own faults. Religious people are often known to be self-righteous. That means, you know, we are right and these people are bad like this, these people are bad like this, these people are bad like this. But the general tendency is to be self-righteous. <coughs> I was in Texas a few months ago uh, uh, and there uh, I saw a poster, uh, some apply, uh, notice on a person's car. So there they had written, Oh God, please save me from your preachers. Oh God, please save me from your preachers. Preachers. Uh, normally, God saves us through his preachers. But if the preachers are self-righteous, condescending, you know, hell and brimstone, okay, then people just get put off by such people. Mm. So, actually, the devotees of the Lord are meant to connect people with the Lord. But sometimes devotees may alienate people from the Lord. Mm -hmm. There is one atheist who said that religion is a very good thing. But the bad thing that religion is, did was that it got mixed up with people. <laughs> when religion gets mixed up with people, religion that is a good thing becomes bad. Now it is not that religion becomes bad, but people bring their mentality to religion. and. Here, we like to differentiate between, say, uh, we could say the ultimate or ideological values that we have and the functional values that we have. So, Srila Prabhupada here in his purport says that uh, if somebody has accepted the, accept the Supreme Personality of God as the goal of life, that, that is to be respected. Among many people who have many different goals in lives, if somebody has accepted that God is the ultimate purpose of my life. They are special. So that is, we could say, their ideological value. Their ideology is the philosophy, the worldview that they accepted, in which God is supreme. However, just because we have a particular ideological value does not necessarily determine how we will function in the world. How we function here will be determined by our functional values. Functional values means that what is the way my nature is, what is the what is the nature of my conditionings, what is the kind of person that I have. I to give a simple example. Suppose I am lost and my car is broken. And finally somebody texts me a message which shows me the way back home. Now I have got the way back home. In that sense I am well situated. But if my car is, is say, damaged and it is emitting a lot of pollution, it is making a lot of unpleasant noise, it is, it is creating a nuisance wherever it goes. Noise pollution, air pollution, even inside also, it jerks, it breaks, it down, I have to start it again, it wears out of control. Now just because I have got the right destination to go back home does not mean that my car has become alright. My journey is rightly directed, but that does not mean that my journey, everything about my journey is right. The kind of car that I have, that will determine how I will drive. If I have got the right address to go, that will determine where I am going to go. I am going to the right destination. But my car is still the way it is. And if the car is damp, if somebody, if my car is also noisy and polluting, and on top of that, I don't even know the destination, that is even worse. So some people who are lost, uh, not knowing the ultimate goal of life, and they are in the mode of ignorance, that is even worse. But just because we have got the path home, does not mean that our car has become alright. 
So in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 18th chapter, Krishna compares the body to a car. Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Vridhesha Arjuna Tishtati Brahmayan Sarva Bhutani Yantra Rudhani Mayaya Yantra Rudhani Mayaya that we are all situated on a yantra, on a material machine made up of material nature. And while being situated in this machine, we all function according to the way the machine is. Uh, soul which is in the snail's body it has got the machine of a snail that soul cannot run like a cheetah or cannot run like a deer a soul which is in a bird's body cannot swim like a fish so these are limitations which are created simply by the species that we are in but beyond that also within a particular body we are impelled to act in particular ways by the kind of body that we have and when we start practicing bhakti that is like we understand what is this body meant to be used for but just because I understand the purpose for which the body is meant to be used does not necessarily mean that the nature of the body mind machine is going to change if I have in the past in this life and in previous lives live in the mode of ignorance then even in this life even after becoming a devotee the mode of ignorance will keep propelling me and if it keeps propelling me then I will be acting largely influenced by the mode of ignorance and the kind of qualities that are described over here abhisandhaya yo himsa dambham matsaryam evava so Sambrami. So one is violent, one is angry, one is envious, one is arrogant. If you see these are in the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the qualities that are described of the demoniac nature. The divine and the demoniac is the chapter, uh, title of the 16th chapter. So Dambho Darpo Bhimanascha Krodha Parushya Mevacha Agyanam Cha Bhijatasya Partha Sampadama Surim so Dambha is showing off, Arvan, Darpa is demanding praise, Abhimana is actually delighting in honor. Vishwanath Chakrathakura explains that each of these are different. Dambha means that even when I don't have good qualities, I pretend to, I pretend to have them and I want to be respected for that. So it's a show. That's like some people, some very VIPs in India, there are some personalities in Bollywood, they come to a temple only on Janmashtami or even then they don't come but whenever they come for them they come into a temple is like a photo op they want to show on their Facebook oh I went to this temple just see how a nice person I am so they are coming to the temple not to take darshan but to give darshan tell the whole world I went to a temple so they are not actually having religious virtue but they want to make a show of it so Dambha means when I don't have a quality still I want to get credit by pretending as if I have the quality Abhimana means I have the quality but my primary purpose in having that quality is uh, how much praise do I get for it. So not having it and pretending it and having it but exhibiting it. These two are both Krishna considers demoniac and Krodha, here Sambrami, angry and Parushya, Parushya is harshness. Harshness is, harshness can mean speech, harshness can mean action which here relates with himsa, violence. So basically, uh, these are qualities of those who are ungodly, of those who are demonic. And here Krishna is saying that devotional service can also be performed like this. It's, it's amazing that it doesn't devotional service transform everyone? Yes, devotional service does transform. But the transformation takes time. And depending on what conditioning who is in, the transformation may take that much amount of time. So if somebody is very deeply conditioned and somebody is not practicing bhakti very intensely, then the mode of ignorance may still prevail even in their practice of bhakti. What will happen is that if we consider a hospital, in a hospital somebody may go to the hospital to get cured. 
but if there somebody is already infected and those people are not properly quarantined then the, these people may give infection to others so now just because somebody is sick with an infectious disease does not mean that they shouldn't be allowed to be in the hospital long ago i was admitted to a hospital for a flu and i ended up getting a tb in the hospital so i got tuberculosis after going to the hospital and then when i got to the hospital uh, because tuberculosis is spread through the mouth it was a very advanced thing so for all that time i was whenever i would meet people or whenever i would go out anywhere i would wear a mask constantly so mm-hmm. one devotee came and told you have become a jain sadhu now <laughs> jains wear masks on their face so but the point is that uh, a person who is sick with an infectious disease uh, can also has a right to be in the hospital but it is not right for the hospital to oh, allow such a person to mix with everyone and it is not for right for everyone in the hospital to mix with that person so similarly shri prabhupad says over here if a vaishnava is affected by the mode of ignorance we respect that this person is is practicing bhakti is accepted the supreme lord as go, as the goal of life but still their association may not be uplifting so we can respect them from distance now of course we don't want to become judgmental here oh, you are in the mode of ignorance so the nature of the mind is that whatever it wants to believe it will adopt uh, utilize whatever it hears to justify its belief so if i don't like some devotee i just you know you are in the mode of ignorance your bhakti is in the mode of ignorance no generally any kind of categorization that we do uh, categorize say in the mode of goodness passion ignorance that categorization is not to put people into boxes it is not to reduce people to certain convenient conceptual categories because people are multifaceted beings somebody may be in the mode of ignorance in one way but they may be in the mode of goodness in some other way somebody may be very unclean and disorderly i'm saying in the mode of ignorance but they may be brilliant at one particular thing and they do it very well so we ex- we appreciate them for what they are good at we keep a distance from them with respect to other things so rather than putting people in boxes and labeling Oh, you, you are in the mode of ignorance. You are in, your bhakti is in ignorance. Your bhakti is in passion. Rather than doing like that, we use the, these analytical schema for understanding the boxes that we ourselves are already in. This is not so much to judge others as to introspect ourselves. So, for us, when we strive to practice bhakti, at that time, uh, our past conditioning does come upon us. and when it comes upon us it influences us in ways which can be dangerous or even disastrous so some ram for example it's angry uh, in our philosophy we have two different ways of approaching anger krishna says in the bhagavad gita that trividham nargasya idam dwaram nashanam atmanah kamah krodhas tatha lobhas tasmade tatra yam tejet he said there are three gates to hell is lust anger and greed so if we act lustily angrily or greedily we are directed towards a hellish destination so we are meant to give up anger if you want to tasmade tatra yam tejet krishna says 16.21 but then we are also told that in devotional service we can use everything even anger can be used in devotional service so for example hanuman you is said to have used anger in devotional service when he burnt lanka so we so a devotee's anger is said to be transcendental it is for it is for krishna's service now when we get angry is our anger for krishna's service or is our anger simply because of the mode of ignorance it is very difficult to know generally when something comes from within no where is it coming from i often speak on understanding the mind uh, so some one common question comes up is that uh, 
when some thought comes up within us how do we know whether it is coming from the mind or it is coming from the intelligence so the usual answer is that it's very difficult to know where something is coming from is almost impossible to know what we can discern however is where it is taking us some idea comes up hey come on do this we have some service to do and the mind says okay you know this car they give you chance 64 rupees every day now is this idea taking me towards krishna yes then i can say this is coming from the intelligence it is basically we can look at what is favorable to our bhakti and accept that and what is unfavorable to our bhakti and avoid that so if i find that i have some responsible service for krishna and i want to chant 64 rounds as a way to avoid that service then actually that 64 rounds will be taking away from krishna so i look at the whole picture and see in the whole picture where is this thought taking me so anukulya sankalpa pratikulya varjana except that which is favorable avoid that which is unfavorable so oh, uh, when some thought comes up from within if it is favorable we accept it if it is unfavorable if it's if it's favorable if it takes us closer to krishna then we can say okay this is coming from the intelligence this is coming from the paramatma rather than focusing on where it is coming on we focus on where it is taking us so similarly with respect to anger anger can be used in devotional service but we have to check what is my anger going to do if i become angry if i yell at someone if i blast out at someone is that going to make things better or is that going to make things worse and if it is going to make things worse then better that i don't become angry better that i control myself and express myself in a more uh, cultured more sensitive more effective way so more often than not because the lower modes are still there within us our anger is frequently because of the mode of ignorance influencing us generally if we consider these three modes of material nature in the mode of goodness we understand what is in my control and what is beyond my control in the mode of passion we overestimate our capacity to control you know this person like this everything should happen like this and i have told you to do this you must do this we think uh, that we are the controllers now of course if we are given a responsible service then we do have to become a controller in the service of the supreme controller and get the service done but still while doing that in the mode of passion we overestimate our capacity to control others we think that uh, this person they should tell the, they should do the way i am telling them to do and if they are not doing it then because i have been appointed to do this service i have a right to chastise them and then i burst out at them so sometimes what happens the mode of passion degenerates to the mode of ignorance very fast in the mode of passion we want to control things and if something can't be controlled then in the mode of ignorance we want to destroy that thing so like sometimes when people are watching a sports match so their favorite team is playing in india people are mad for cricket every country is something people are mad for america it may be baseball or soccer or whatever so when their favorite team is playing and they are watching the tv they may glue to the tv they don't want to let their attention go anywhere else and if their favorite team loses they may just take a bar and slam the tv and break the tv now what is breaking the tv going to achieve but the idea is this this tv was meant to give me enjoyment this tv was meant to increase my idea that i am the controller and the enjoyer and if the tv is not doing that i will destroy it i will destroy it so uh, mode of passion where i want to be the controller if i can't be the controller then i will be the destroyer i'll destroy you sometimes when uh, young people have some romantic ideas you know a boy one is infatuated with the girl and if the girl says no then the boy can become even violent i met one devotee who is who is working with acid attack victims sometimes what happens some boys if they want to be with the girl and the girl refuses their idea becomes you no know, if you oh, i won't be with me you won't be with anyone else 
and they take some acid and just throw it on the girl's face and the girl gets terribly disfigured by that her life gets ruined so here what is happening passion is degenerating into ignorance passion means i want to be the enjoyer if i can't be the enjoyer then i'll be the destroyer and i will destroy you so similarly sometimes what happens in our devotional service we want some other devotee to do something the way we want them to do and if they don't act in that way then we wanted to be the controllers and then we become the destroyers destroyer means what we destroy that good de- that devotee's reputation we are you know, devoted to this did this did this did this we start broadcasting all over the world nowadays with internet available you know one can just put something on facebook and it can become viral so social media we can just uh, destroy people's lives so in this case the violence that we are committing is not physical most devotees being a little we live in a culture society where also we know that uh, there is a rule of law physical violence will be very strictly uh, punished but we may do other verbal violence so now yes that devotee did not do what i wanted them to do and that that is a fault in them but we have to see things in perspective that yes okay this fault is there but that does not mean the whole devotee is faulty they may have not done this and yes some action may have to be taken for them but there is no need to destroy that whole devotee's life or their reputation or their service but the nature of the conditioned mind is like that no you did not do this you did this mistake and the whole world has to be told that you did this mistake and sometimes some devotees start thinking that they are self appointed protectors of the tradition you know they say you know this devotee is doing this wrong and by broadcasting to the whole world that i am doing that this devotee is doing this wrong i am actually protecting the tradition well our responsibility is to protect our devotion first if we are criticizing devotees that is a vaishnava aparadha and that can have very serious consequences for our own devotional life so therefore himsa when we do violence then that is simply uh, the mode of ignorance within us acting out we may say that i am doing it with a devotional intention but the devotional intention will not lead to any congenial action it will lead to a very detrimental or dangerous action so for us uh, uh, the devotional service in the mode of ignorance can very well mean that we end up fighting amongst each other each person trying to prove i am right i am right i am right you are wrong we are all individual living beings and our individuality is irreducible irreducible means that i am eternally an individual and you are eternally an individual and so is everyone else so all of us will have our opinions all of us have will have our understandings all of us will have our own inspirations about how to do things so sometimes the two people's ideas of doing things may just not agree so we may have to disagree but we don't have to be disagreeable we may have to disagree but we don't have to be disagreeable disagreement is simply a fact of life we all are different so natural disagreements will be there but being disagreeable be unpleasant irritable nasty towards each other that is actually a characteristic of the mode of ignorance and unfortunately sometimes our devotion may make us self righteous i am doing this because you are so bad and because you are hurting others well whether that person is hurting others or not i am hurting myself and i am hurting others so a lot of conflicts among devotees happens because we presume our motives to be transcendental while our actions tend to be in ignorance or passion so while our actions are driven simply by the lower modes within us just because we have become devotees doesn't mean that our devotion has become and our devotion our everything about our devotion has become spiritual or everything has become positive so there are many secular thinkers who say that what we need for peace in the world is for peace what we need is a world without religion just imagine 
there will be no religion there will be no fighting there will be no there would be <coughs> no crusades no jihads no this no that the world would be so peaceful now actually it is not that religion is the cause of war last and last last sunday i was in washington dc where i spoke elaborately on this topic of cause of war but on the sunday feast class but the point is that majority of the people in the world are in the mode of passion and ignorance and even when they practice religion it is their passion and ignorance that comes out and that's why in the name of religion also violence can happen but in the name of atheism also violence can happen the communist rules say in china and ussr they killed millions of people their own citizens without any war being fought the number of people killed by the communist governments in their own countries is more than the number of people killed in first world war and second world war combined together so there is if the lower modes are there it will it will affect the way we function and that's why we need to recognize okay i have accepted the, as a ideological value i have accepted krishna as my goal but what are my functional values how am i functioning just because i have got the best goal does not mean that my actions are the best or even that my actions are good so when we become introspective like this then we can act, uh, we can become real and our bhakti can become transformational bhakti is meant to transform us but the mind is so cunning that the mind can misappropriate the process of bhakti to continue our deformed condition that means bhakti can free me from anger if i practice bhakti diligently but the mind is so cunning that it makes me angry and makes me think that i am this is devotional anger and thus actually the mind uses the bhakti to continue the deformed condition so we if we don't address our inner issues properly we won't let the process of bhakti work properly in us all the bhakti can transform anyone we may not get transformed we may still stay stuck where we are because our mind's ideas are blocking the current of bhakti from cleansing our heart so when bhakti is in the mode of ignorance it will also purify because if one is doing bhakti it is going to purify but because it is done in the mode of ignorance it is going to create a lot of trouble for ourselves as well as others because just like if a, i said a vehicle is broken it is noisy it is polluting it is jerky then the person who is driving they are going to face trouble and the people who are driving nearby people who are living nearby they are also going to face trouble so similarly as long as we are in the mode of ignorance we are going to hurt ourselves and we are going to hurt others even while we are practicing bhakti so we need to now we may not uh, have a lot of mode of ignorance within us but some traces of ignorance are there in all of us and those need to be addressed so by recognizing that bhakti is transcendental but i am not at all i may not be transcendental right now we can uh, become more self critical in terms of evaluating how i am practicing bhakti and then take shelter of krishna how to change the situation how to actually take shelter of krishna while we are in the lower modes that i'll discuss in tomorrow and day after tomorrow's class when i speak about bhakti in the mode of passion and bhakti in the mode of goodness so i'll summarize what i spoke today i talked about bhakti in the three modes which kapil dev is analyzing over here and he exhibits a significant level of self criticality whereas religions are said to be self righteous the bhagavatam shows how even religious teachers can be self critical and practicing bhakti gives us the best ideological value it's like a person who is lost in a broken car they find the address by which they can go back home but just because our ide- ideological value has become right doesn't mean our functional value has become right the car is still be polluting noisy 
jerky so our body may still be conditioned by the mode of ignorance and it may impel us to act in ignorant ways so religious people if they become self righteous then even the wrong actions they rationalize as right based on their uh, religious ideas ideologies so people may do violence in the name of religion but actually they are doing violence simply because they are impelled by the mode of ignorance so in generally in the mode of passion we want to be the controllers and if passion gets frustrated we want to become destroyers so that can happen in the outside world where people want to kill those who think that they are opposed to um, boys may want to disfigure girls but that can happen in devotee circle also where somebody who doesn't go along with our plans we go on a campaign of character assassination thinking that we are protecting the tradition from this deviant person actually we are simply giving in to ignorance in the name of transcendence so everybody has a right to practice bhakti but everybody needs the right place to practice bhakti uh, if somebody is sick with an infectious disease they also have a right to be in the hospital but the hospital cannot allow them to mix with everyone and infect everyone else so if we are in, if somebody is infected by the mode of ignorance then they will infect everyone else so so prabhupad says that those who are infected those who are in the mode of ignorance and are practicing bhakti we have to respect them for their practice of bhakti but keep a distance from them so we should not become judgmental about others and put people into convenient boxes and label and condemn them this sort of analysis is primarily so that we can understand which boxes we are in right now and protect ourselves so anger is a gate to hell it is a sign of ignorance but it can also be in the service of krishna in transcendence so how do we know whether my anger is in ignorance or in transcendence we it's very difficult to know whether it is coming from our ego or mind or whether it's coming from the intelligence of the paramatma better to see not where it is coming from but where it is taking us if the effect is going to be constructive then express it if it is going to be destructive you want to hurt alienate people then better calm down and express things in a more civilized way so rather than thinking of ourselves as transcendental as self appointed protectors of the tradition we should see that i am simply a practitioner humble practitioner and let me get my bhakti right so when we become self aware then we can also do not detect the ignorant and the passionate tendencies within us and correct them since otherwise we will still practice bhakti will still be purified but our bhakti practice will hurt us and hurt others but if we curb the mode of force within us by introspection and by purification then our bhakti will become more and more joyful for ourselves and for others so thank you very much are there any questions or comments yes bro you had a question also bro hari krishna you also had a question i mean we can start with you <coughs> you can speak i'll repeat you can just speak bro. i'll repeat it i I'll, i'll repeat it no i'll i'll repeat it yes i'll repeat the question uh thanks now thanks for the class channel um i wonder if uh, we can call that a person that practices party in the mode of ignorance and in the mode of passion criticizing and, and looking at others and we call that party still can we call that uh, okay good question if somebody is acting in the mode of ignorance say criticizing fault finding can we call that bhakti at all it's very difficult to uh, become hyper analytical of things so if i am giving a class in that class maybe 70% of what i speak is glorification of krishna but one or two points i speak which might just be my own vested agenda my anger my resentment coming out so now if that happens then is the class devotional service or not 
well you can say that some part of most of the class of the ocean service but some of it may not be so rather than just uh, uh, saying that what you are doing is not bhakti now we have to just help people to do bhakti better because our purpose is not to uh, as i said label and condemn we could say that somebody who is going on a on a say campaign of criticizing others you are not performing bhakti but they may have some good intention many times it is hurt people that hurt people now if i have been hurt by someone then i go out and hurt hurting others so then if i tell them you are not performing bhakti at all uh, that only makes them more insecure more angry and then things become worse so okay we appreciate they may have some devotional intention but it's like the the soul or the heart is here the body and the mind are here and the world is out here so i may have a devotional intention but the devotional intention is expressed through the body mind that i have and the, if the body mind are largely influenced by ignorance then the expression may come out as ignorant so rather than saying that you know what you are doing is not bhakti at all i say okay what you are doing the intention may be good but the way you are doing it may not be so good so we have to rather than label just communicate in a way that helps make the situation better because we don't know who is doing what with what intention somebody who acts very devotionally we may have a very anti devotional intention and somebody who seems to be acting very anti devotionally may have a devotional intention but for us to function in a cultured way we need to have a devotional intention and a devotional action so there will be differences but differences uh, can come stem from genuine concern also but then they have to be expressed in a, a sattvic way in a mode of goodness in a cultured way the answer your question thank you yes very nice class and uh, i was thinking that suppose i am a devotee i have to fly to a place in the dress this no dress anything but we are not going to this pool of silver cloth that means all the same jarak hari ko krishna who whoever you see and where is i'm just telling you this and i'm not following that principle but i i am doing so many other speculative things so many pleasure of my friends it's like a word on the face of suppose then suppose somebody criticizes me and criticizes me gives a suggestion some sort of problem you are so nice you can do something hmm. i think tell about something about this now or not and not not really not to be stupid so i have not followed that and uh, so we will think that how we can say it is just criticize us and suggestion can be called as criticize or it will be an offense uh um, means you're talking about somebody else giving us that suggestion are they criticizing us yeah okay okay so if somebody is speaking about of mundane things and is not speaking about krishna and then we offer them a suggestion you know please speak about krishna but they don't accept it so is our offering a suggestion is it is it a criticism is it a offense no the word offense can sometimes get bandied out around very loosely in devotional circles uh, we may just use use the word offense very loosely uh, generally offense refers to that which is done with a bad intention hmm? that's primary when i see some devotee successful influential popular and that makes me feel i want to pull this devotee down if that that enviousness is there then that is definitely an offense but if our intention is good then generally it is not a serious offense but still just because my intention is good doesn't mean that i i shouldn't care for my actions it's like say if we are all dancing in kirtans and then you know i want i'm angry with some devotee so i pretend to be in ecstasy and i start going round and round and round and go towards the devotee with my hands like i give the devotee a slap now i am doing that intentionally but that is definitely offense 
But suppose I go into ecstasy and I start dancing and singing and my hands are wide apart and I hit some devotee. Now my intention was not to hit, but still I have hit. So that is also something I should apologize for. Now in a technical sense, is it aparad? Look, we have to better play safe and I am sorry for this. I didn't intend to do this. So our intention is what makes something definitely an aparad. If it intention is to pull down somebody else. But if the intention is not bad, still if the action turns out to be counterproductive or turns out to be hurting others, then it can be an offense. So if we are offering suggestion in a humble mood, uh, wanting to help the other person, and if that person becomes very aggressive, you, know, you just mind your own business, I know what I'm doing. I'm doing uh, they become, then we can just say, I'm sorry if I offended you, and we move on with our life. We don't have to give suggestions where they are not welcome. Because ultimately our time is limited, our energy is limited and our emotions are limited. So generally when we reciprocate with someone, it's like say some unfamiliar person comes at our door. Initially, nowadays of course we have security cameras, but initially we might look through the peephole or we might open the door with a small chain and chain over there and see who is there. And does this person look safe? They have some necessary important business over there. We may open the door, let them in. So, like that, our relationships are also similarly. We open the door of heart, our heart a little bit, and we offer a small suggestion. And if they accept it, then we open our heart more. They open their hearts more, and the relationship develops. But if they start shouting, at us, they start becoming aggressive or defensive. Then okay, you know, this person is not interested. We just move on then. So that way we can decide. Okay. Can we come back to you? Let's let me come back to you. Right. Yes, bro. Teachers, uh, parents, 
children, you know, like that, and it creates that anger and that sort of rejection. How do you deal with those type of things in a compassionate way that is more in line with what you're explaining? Okay, that yeah. So internal. If somebody has some ignorant tendencies because of which uh, they have crossed some lines which, which, cannot, which cannot be allowed to be crossed and people have been hurt by that. So we want to be compassionate to that devotee but at the same time we also have to protect the community. So what do we, how do we deal with such a situation? Yeah, it's a very difficult situation. Generally, if a devotee is given a leadership position, then that devotee definitely needs to have good character, means at least some amount of goodness and some strong capacity to control the modes of passion and ignorance. They may come up, but one should be able to control them. So, if some devotee has done something grievously wrong, then it, that doesn't mean that you have to be rejected from the practice of bhakti, but they cannot be given a leadership position. I, I know one temple where there was one person, he, he was a brilliant singer and he was a brilliant teacher of singing and music. But he was also a habitual drunkard. So his wife was a devotee, initial devotee, but he was uh, alcoholic. And he would come to the temple smelling alcohol. Now he was never allowed to sing kirtans for the deities, but he had the desire, he liked to sing Hare Krishna. So in other places in the temple, say in some rooms, he would train devotees how to play musical instruments. He would train devotees uh, how to sing different ra different tunes, different ragas, and he was good at his work, good at his. That was he was also a professional music teacher. So now his devotion service can be accepted. I mean, it's valued also, the devotees appreciated him. But then he cannot be made as a representative of the community leading kirtans for the deities. If he wants to come alone to the temple and sing for the deities, they can do that. But when we are presenting ourselves as a community and doing a arti for the Lord, doing a puja, doing a kirtan, at time he cannot be given. So that means the broad principle I draw from this is that uh, anybody who wants to render devotional service whatever be their past or even whatever be their present we need to give them the facility to provide uh, to uh, to perform devotional service but it is just as they have a right to practice devotional service others also have a right to practice devotional service and if the way they practice uh, devotional service is going to negatively influence others then certain adjustments have to be made and they also have to have the humility to accept those adjustments you know, I have this particular uh, particular issue with me and we don't have to publicly talk about that. Discreetly, it can be explained to them in a respectful, at the same time, uh, uh, firm way. So, if they are ready to agree to that, then Krishna's uh, movement is so inclusive that everybody can be included. But where it becomes a problem is, if somebody who has done serious wrongs or who is doing something seriously wrong, their wrongs are completely overlooked and they are glorified as if they are great people. Then especially those who have been hurt by their bad actions uh, will feel infuriated by that. So that line in real life is, is very difficult to, uh, difficult to balance. Where that particular person, sometimes they themselves may have rendered a lot of service before, then they did something wrong and then again they are trying to render service. So, what to focus on? We want to focus on how they can stay connected with Krishna, how can they can move towards Krishna. So, I would say both have to have an understanding attitude. Somebody who has been hurt, they also need to understand that you know, I don't have to go on an agenda of demonizing this person. They done something in the past and let the past be history now. Let, me not, you know, let the past stay in the past now. I don't have to dredge up the history unless that person is given a position of power by which they may repeat it. If that is happening, then strong action has to be taken. So, from there are three ways. That person has to have the humility 
to accept whatever facility they are given to practice serve, devotional service without demanding a leadership position. Hmm? Those who have been victims, they have to know that you know this person did this to me, but now my life's mission doesn't have to be to get back at that person. My life's mission is to move towards Krishna and let me focus on doing that which I can to move towards Krishna. And from the leader's perspective, they have to make sure that uh, the right of one person to practice bhakti, whether it is the victimizer or the victim, should not infringe on the other person's right to practice bhakti. So both need to be, the, the, the victim can be given facility without giving a leadership position, the victimizer, without giving a leadership position. And everybody needs to be uh, facilitated in the way that they can move towards Krishna. That's in broad principles. Practices, I think, will have to be worked out on an individual case-to-case -case basis. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. You had something to comment, Mother? Okay. So, should we stop here or we can go ahead? No, we can go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Sorry? Anger or what? Anger. Yeah. So, um, we are obviously knowing when we have all our own ignorance to some extent. And using the anger appropriately in some situations, like for example, in extreme situations, you mentioned um, where there's like cases of abuse like, um, from leaders. And, um, but how to reach out to other people or use that gift of anger in a positive way. I mean, I can remember in my life sometimes where someone said something at the time that seemed really insensitive, but since it was such a powerful emotion with anger, it be that, like, kind of like, that was, you know, I didn't like it. I kept thinking about that, and, and then later on, I was like, you know, I think he might have been right. So, um, and we can also see how anger is offered. I mean, the problem with that, a lot of times, we'll see talk about, um, some leaders of society, politicians, with that um, harsh words, not in, like a, in a negative way, but in, like in the um, that moment of truth, like just speaking truth. And, um, yeah, I got your question. So yeah. you're saying that some people may actually be using anger in a constructive way for Krishna's service, and even if somebody is a recipient of that anger, at that time they feel furious, furious, but later they realize actually it was it was right what they were saying. So, how do we see this? In the Mahabharata, uh, morality or right and wrong actions, how to understand them, three broad criteria are given. One ultimate criteria is that we consult scripture. But actions can be understood as right or wrong based on intent, content and consequence. Why am I doing something? What exactly am I doing? And what is the result of what I am doing? Based on all these three factors, we can decide whether a particular action is right or wrong. So now, consider that somebody becomes angry, shout, yells at someone else. Now, in content, we could say that it is primarily because of ignorance most of the times. But in special cases, it may be also out of transcendence because of one's devotion to Krishna. Then, if that is the case, uh, in content, we can leave it suspended. If it's a devotee doing it, it could be because of transcendence also. You can look at the intent. Okay, the intent was actually to help the other person. Intent was not just to get back at them. But then consequence. Sometimes something may have the same strong speech to someone may have a positive consequence. The strong speech to someone else may have a negative consequence. So we can't universalize. In your case, when somebody spoke strongly to you, uh, later on you realize it was right. So I would say that is also to your credit. And not just your credit in a uh, self-congratulatory sense, but also in a healthy sense. Basically, if some consider a vaccine, uh, if somebody has normal or good immunity, when they are given a vaccine, that causes their body to generate further uh, uh, white WBC, white cells, and that increases their immunity. So the vaccine makes them stronger to resist the disease. But if their immunity is already very low and then they are given a vaccine and the vaccine may actually give them the disease. So similarly, we could say uh, the immunity of the person is like the basic 
self self worth or self respect or self confidence that a person has if a person has a basic level of self respect basic level of self confidence self esteem then even if somebody criticizes we don't see that so much as a personal attack uh, okay this person spoke this to me yeah i felt bad but what they said was right but if somebody doesn't have is extremely low self esteem they're already very depressed and on top of that criticism comes at that time then they just think hey, i just can't do it only and they may quit completely or you know the up with the uh, the perverse exp ex perverse expression of a low self esteem is a high uh, is a high self uh, self high bravo and bluff bluff and bravado where you know people appear to be very aggressive and confident just to cover up their ins internal insecurity so then that person because they feel threatened by their criticism they will just lash out at someone else so the point which i am making is the when we look at the consequence of something it is not just the person who is doing it but the person on whom it is being done also matters so if say speaking strongly it is like doing surgery the sadhus are meant to cut they meant to cut our misconceptions but in surgery is never the first line of treatment surgery has to be done with the consent of the patient surgery has to be done after anesthesia is given and after surgery also pain medicine has to be given so there is a whole context in the surgery is done so similarly if there is a healthy relationship that has been developed between two people beforehand and if that person subordinate is accepted that this person is a authoritative person with respect to shri prabhupad even if it were not his disciples still his very age made a big difference he just because of his age people were somewhat deferential to him, others now if you or i speak in the same way as prabhupad spoke using strong words that acceptance of authority may not be there at all and so basically we have to look at the overall context so do we have a healthy relationship in which even if a person gets wounded by some strong words they have the support system by which they can recover and see the positive within it otherwise sometimes even if somebody is doing something wrong letting them learn by bearing the consequences that wrong will reform them better than trying to chastise them because speaking strongly to them may alienate them from krishna and they may just give up the practice of bhakti so yes we do, as a devotee is who are trying to share krishna's message there are times when we need to speak strongly but we cannot take that as a license that every strong speech that anybody is making any devotee is making is necessarily uh, devotional service we have to see the overall context see the level of the person and then based on the consequence hey, last time i spoke this to this person he was so insecure but this person i spoke to so 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 grateful actually so this person i can this person is kept, is at a situation where they can receive feedback this person is not that way we can learn from this situation okay so thank you very much the last question stop this yes. subject can we address it tomorrow because the how modes act in the devotee's life is something i was going to talk in the classes in the mode of passion and goodness i'll talk it tomorrow is it okay thank you very much is much
Sometimes when we are sentimental, we just say that, you know, don't criticize anyone, don't see any faults, everything that everyone is doing is devotional service. And in being sentimental, those people may be ignorant and they may also perpetuate somebody else who is doing something in ignorance. And that way, things can go off track. Yes. It's true that we have, a, we have some objective standards that need to be followed. And there are certain things which are wrong. We cannot just say because there is a devotee, we should not criticize devotees. If some devotee starts, uh, if devotee is eating meat or gambling or uh, drinking or breaking a regulatory principle, we cannot say this is a devotee, I should not speak anything about it. Yeah, we don't have to necessarily publicize it to the world that this devotee has done this. But that is a serious breach of devotional standards. And we cannot be sentimental about it. Sometimes, uh, in the name of being uh, being non-critical, we may become very gullible, and that can be dangerous. So, therefore, there is the mode of goodness which helps us analyze things properly. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that dharma and adharma in the uh, 18th chapter verses 30 to 32 he talks about um, intelligence in the three modes and he talks about in the mode of ignorance adharmam dharma mitya manyate tamasavrataha sarvarthan viparitamsha buddhi sapartha tamasi that intelligence in the mode of ignorance means that one thinks the right to be wrong and the wrong to be right is one perceives everything opposite. So, considering something which is obviously wrong to be right, that is sentimental. And you could say that is ignorant. So, in the name of sentimentality, if we are doing that, then, then sentimentality is also ignorant. So, broadly, if we study scripture regularly and associate with devotees who are living according to scripture, then our Shastra Chakshu gets developed. Our capacity to see through the eyes of scripture gets developed properly. And if we are also associating with cultured devotees, then how to how to communicate wrong things so that they can be corrected effectively, that also we learn. Because if something is wrong, it needs to be pointed out. But then there is a proper forum to do that. Generally, we should talk with that devotee or we talk with some senior devotee who is connected with that devotee and explain to them. Sometimes if nothing is happening, then we may have to take up uh, that cause if it is a serious issue. But basically, to do it in a, in a cultured way, that is the mode of goodness. And sometimes if nothing is working, you now we point out this is wrong and nobody pays any attention to it. Then we have to decide what is my service to Krishna and how important is this particular thing for my service to Krishna. So, if it is extremely important, then I may have to take up that as a cause to correct it. Otherwise, it is that maybe I don't have the power, I don't have the zeal right now, I don't have the influence. So, then I pray to Krishna and I continue with my service. Because sometimes if we take up a battle which we are not equipped to fight, there are so many things wrong in the world and because Krishna's movement is also part of the world, there are many things may be wrong here also. But if we don't have the, have the, we can't fight all these battles. So we have to choose which battle I want to fight. 
uh, that is a battle which we want to fight, then we can take it up as a cause to deal with. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Grantraj, Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srimad Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki, Chaitai Gaur Premanandi.